Bruchem Aboim. Thank you all for coming. Um, today we're going to start a new series called My Thoughts, and this will deal with um, hopefully questions that all of us have about God, about life, about happiness, about children, success, anger, all the emotions, all the uh, travails that we go through, those that are up, those that are down, uh, and what do we do with them. Um, and um, what I'd like to start off with is the beginning. I mean, if we don't acknowledge there's a God, then the whole thing kind of loses its value. So the real question becomes, and I guess there are people that debate that, even though it always amazes me because it's generally scientists, and doctors, those that I always think should be the most religious of all people. No one is more aware of the miracles of the beauty, of the symmetry, of the immense wonder of the universe than doctors who are able to see what's happening with the body and the miracle of the body and the, those scientists are able to see that which we come, become more and more aware of in the scientific world, especially today as things have moved ahead by leaps and bounds. Uh, just an amazing world that we live in. Uh, it almost takes your breath away. The truth of the matter is, is that uh, our belief that the Jews who left Egypt and then crossed the sea and then stood at the, heart, at the foot of Mount Sinai and received the Torah from God, I'm not so sure that if one of them spent a day walking around with us today, that they would be just in awe and wonder at the miracles they saw, that we live in a miraculous world today. But miracles are that which you're not used to. When you see them, you know, money growing on a tree. If money grew on a tree, it wouldn't be a miracle. If you saw it once, then it'd be a miracle. A miracle, by definition, is something that happens infrequently that you never really see. Once you see it all the time, it no longer becomes a miracle. It's something you get used to. So what I'd like to deal with today is the question that people have. Um, can we really prove there's a God? And uh, it's my belief that you really can. Um, but if there's faith, and of course there is, uh, although God expects us to find him, God kind of plays hide and seek. And he's hiding, it's our job to find him. And most often than not, we're not playing the game, uh, which is sad. But if you play the game, um, you will find him because he is there to be found and that's his greatest joy, that we do make an effort to try to find him, to use this great brain that God has given us to see him and acknowledge him and to find the honor and privilege it is to serve him. But science by its very nature is something that is based on being able to recreate something in a laboratory. And that's how science proves something to be true. So the truth of the matter is that no one can prove there's not a God. At best, they can have a belief that there's not a God. We, too, can have a belief that there is a God. And the amazing thing is that we are much less believers than they are. It's just hard to believe that this world, this magnificent world that we live in, could somehow, some way, just have happened. That there's a big bang, and all of a sudden, this world comes into existence. Uh, survival of the fit is something from water moves up on land. Um, if you take a million monkeys and put them in front of a million typewriters, no one's writing a sentence. They're not writing, I mean, definitely writing a book. And to believe that this world that we live in would be able to be with this magnificence, and everything works. Um, it's like a computer program, really. And maybe years ago, there's so much happening today that in the world we live that puts a real spin, a real understanding to God being the ultimate programmer, if you will. And the world, we're basically working on that program. And it works very well. You know? If they, Haley's Comet's supposed to come in 82 years, it comes in 82 years when they say it's going to come. It's amazing. They can predict all types of things. And they come true. Now, the only thing that they can't predict, and that's why the world's in a bit of chaos, is we were created, but Salam Elohim, it says in the book of Bereshit in Genesis, we were created in the image of God, which 
strange because we believe that God has no form. He has no image. But the Torah very clearly says we were created in the image of God. So what does that mean? Basically that the only thing in creation that has free will, that can choose to go left or right, to do good or evil, is God and man. Everything else is a program. Everything is programmed to do what it does, and it does exactly what it's programmed to do. The only fly in the ointment is us. God gives us the ability to choose good or to choose evil, and that is the struggle of life. And it is a struggle. And through our discussions here, we will be dealing with that struggle and hopefully finding ways to overcome that struggle, especially because God kind of stacked the deck against us and created us, as it says in the Torah, Ram and Ar of evil from birth. But that's for another lecture. God, how do, we, uh, how do we know, how can we say that there's a God in the world? I'm not a scientist. In fact, I'm a restaurateur, so I deal with things on a very basic level of what tastes good, what looks good, what makes you uh, want to eat more. But basically on a very simple level if you walk in if you're in a forest and you come upon a cabin then you open the door to the cabin and it's a cold winter day and you walk in and to your enjoyment there's a fire going and you look and there's light in the cabin the table set and there's food on the table the beds are made there's no dust anywhere the house is in order. But you don't see anybody. Does someone live there? Of course, someone lives there. And that's really the world. Whether we see God or not, there is God's presence every place we look. There is a saying when um, Abraham took Isaac, Avram took Yitzchak, at the Akedah, when he bound him up on the altar to bring him up as a sacrifice. There's a verse that says in the Hebrew, and he saw the place from a distance. And when we do the Haggadah, we refer to God as Hamakam, the place. There is really a belief that uh, the, God is not in the world. The world is within God. And in a sense, there are those who believe that in reality, it's not whether does God exist, the question is do we exist? Uh, if you saw the movie The Matrix, the key becomes is do we exist at all or are we just in the mind of God? And maybe that's why we dream. Because when we go to sleep at night, instantaneously we create a world. And that world is perfect. We don't have to wait for people to grow. They are where we want them to be when they are. And everything that moves, everything that exists, everything that is in our dream is only there as long as we think about it. We stop thinking about it, it's gone. So there is a belief that even a leaf that moves across a meadow is moving across that meadow and exists because God wants it to, because God is focusing on it. So all that really exists is God. So when we say that, we, that Avramino said he saw the place from a distance, on a simple level, it means that God withdrew his presence from Abraham to make the test more difficult. But what it means also is that seeing God as kind of the forest because of the trees when we're so close in a situation, sometimes hard to do. That may be a belief that God is with you. You know, the famous poem of God when, when a person was told by God that they, that they would be with them all the time. And they look back and they're walking down the beach. And in the sand, they only see one set of prints. And they yell out to God, you said you'd be with me all the time. There's only one set of prints. And God answers the person, that's because I'm carrying you. So God is there all the time. And when you look, merachok, when you look back on your life, unless you're a fool, God becomes very evident. Because all of the coincidences all of the accidents, all of the good luck, all of the timing, which you can call that and people do, is really the hand of God. It's no different than a person who, uh, you know, they, uh, a, yeah, they have these car seats that have steering wheels. 
and the baby's in the back seat driving the car, which of course he's not. And that's how we feel. So if you look in, into your past, many times God becomes very evident. But let's, be, let, let's try to find more evidence that there is a God. What is history? So history can really be defined as eyewitness report. And if I were to ask you, did George Washington live? Father of our country, of course, the answer would be yes. So just all I have to do is look at a dollar bill. We know that he lived. Now, and even that says in God we trust. But how do we know that George Washington lived? All these people saw him. How many people saw him? So I would venture if 100,000 people saw, actually saw George Washington, it was probably a lot. Yet we know, or we believe, that George Washington lived. As we did. That, that is a fact. Now, when it comes to two other major religions, Christianity and Islam, Jesus is seen by a handful of people when he is resurrected, and they are of dubious character. And people believe that he did, he was resurrected by virtue of their eyewitness report. Christianity, Muhammad goes up to heaven, he and his horse. Judaism is totally different. When God gives the Torah to the Jews on Mount Sinai, and even before that, when he takes them out of Egypt with all the miracles that the Torah talks about in Egypt, and again, this was to the world. The world was able to have a front view seat of what happened. But that's in Egypt. Then God goes to the Red Sea. And he splits the sea. And every body of water splits. And it says in the in Yechezkel, in the prophets, that a maidservant saw more when the sea was split than Yechezkel the prophet saw when he went up to heaven in a fiery chariot. But, and then from there they went to Mount Sinai. And in Mount Sinai you had 600,000 men, the Torah says, between the ages of 20 to 60. There were people, there were men who were younger than that. Some were older. And their wives, women. So altogether there had to be a minimum of two to three million people that went out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, stood at Mount Sinai, and received the Torah from God. With the revelation that was so real and so intense that the Medrash says they died when they first heard the first commandment of God and had to be resurrected died when they heard the second one. And then finally said to Moses, we, know, we can't take this anymore. Please, give us the Torah. Find out what God wants. Tell us. That's why the numerical value of the word Torah is not 613, which we, we believe. We have 613 commandments. There are other sub-commandments that go with it, but 613 basic commandments. And the numerical value of Torah is 611, because the first two we heard directly from God, which told us that God gave us the Torah. But let's even say, for the sake of being a contrarian, which we as Jews are very good at, and say that maybe not. Maybe the Jews didn't come out of Egypt. Maybe the Jews didn't cross the Red Sea. These are kind of one-time events. Maybe the Jews didn't even stand on Mount Sinai and receive the Torah when the whole world was quiet and the whole world knew. Not a bird flew. There was not a sound in the world. The whole world was a witness to that fact. But even that, we'll say a one-time event. One-time event, you can poo-poo. Maybe not. Well, I guess we're going to keep this down to 15 minutes. So for the next lecture, we will continue with this theme to prove that without a doubt that this, lap, this event in history actually happened. And please uh, come to our coming attractions of the reasons why. Thank you for coming.